Hello. Uh, welcome all my friends and, and church members to the uh, midweek Bible study. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, this week, as we continue our study in 1 Thessalonians, uh, we're going to look at the realities of suffering and tragedy. Uh, before we jump in, would you join me in prayer? Father, I come before you uh, asking that you would bless this time for the glory of your kingdom. Lord, as we, as we dive into your word, we look at the realities of life in this fallen universe. Father, may you speak to us. May you guide us. Lord, as we ask, and as the scriptures ask tough questions, may we truly look inside and see what our answers are. So, Father, I pray that you would help us with your spirit in this time as we spend it in your scriptures. Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um. So today we're we're picking up in First Thessalonians chapter two, verse fourteen. We uh, ended in fourteen where it says, "And for you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Jesus Christ that are in Judea." And and uh, you know we were talking about being in ministry. How do we conduct ourselves in ministry? Uh, I believe from the scriptures that we are all. In ministry, um, every single one of us is called to go and make disciples. Everybody's ministry will look different and have different sizes and, and all those things, but the call is still the same: to go and do your part, whatever that is, and that's between you and God, whatever your part is. But the scriptures command that all of us to go and make disciples. Um, and so as we are all here in ministry, what does that look like? Man, well, it looks like that we are imitators of God, uh, but that passage continues on uh, and says this, for they weren't only just imitators of, of God and their actions uh, and, and of Christian people throughout the churches, but they are also imitators of their suffering. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them in la at last. But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time in person, but not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face. Because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope and our joy or our crown of boasting before the Lord Jesus in his coming? Is it not you? For you are glory and joy. So the reality is that these Thessalonian Christians, they were living for God. They were being imitators of fellow Christians that they were learning from. But in their imitation came the reality of suffering. That even though just as like the, the early Christian churches in Judea and throughout Jerusalem, they were following God, doing things biblically, listening to him, wanting to, to love people and care about people and spread the good news of, of Christ, that he came to rescue mankind. The, there were their fellow countrymen, the, the people of Jerusalem and Judea called the Jews, and they didn't like the message. And they persecuted the early church. And it drove them out and it separated them. And, and, and the, the gospel went outwards and onwards and these Thessalonian Christians as they begin to 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 learn about Christ and give their life to him and follow him they come under the same kind of persecution uh, because Christianity kind of messes things up you know in a world that is uh, very much uh, has economics around idolatry man when, when a Christian doesn't need a little trinket to speak to a, a man-made deity anymore. They don't need all these little um, idols and, and, and pictures and talismans to, to bless their life. No, because Christ is the real God. And Christ, he comes in and he changes everything. 
And you don't need a, a little idol or a man-made statue. You don't need to buy that stuff to gain blessings anymore. You spiritually have Christ in you through the Holy Spirit. And you can speak directly to God himself through Jesus. That's, that's the miracle of Christ, that you can know God. And so Christianity really comes and it messes things up. We saw that through all of Acts. Um, and, uh, when we went through our study of Acts, man, Paul would call, come into these towns and people would get mad. You know, he would mess up their businesses. People wouldn't be buying their idols and, and uh, their little statues anymore, you know, because they don't need that anymore. They don't need all these uh, man-made religious artifacts, you know, uh, man, Paul would cast out demons, and so people couldn't use uh, demons anymore to, to tell the future. Um, or, or maybe Paul would mess with people's philosophy and go, man, you think uh, that God over there and that statue is the real God. Man, let me tell you about the real creator of the universe. Or maybe he would mess, or, or you know, man, things would, uh, the Jews would get uh, irritated and mad because everything in the Old Testament points to Christ. But they didn't want to change. They didn't want to accept the Messiah and believe in him. So they kept just doing things what they've always done. And, and it would pull people, they would see the light. That, that everything points to Christ. That Christ has come and that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No longer the sacrificial system. And it would pull people out of the synagogues and, and the Jewish leaders would get mad and irritated and frustrated and they'd run Paul out of town. He'd move on to the next one. And so the reality is that the Christ changes things. And the suffering comes with those, those changes as well. You know, following God, being a part of, of God's plan, serving him, loving him, obeying him, does not exempt the Christian from suffering. It's the truth. You know, there have been many times in my life, uh, man, I, I wish I had gotten that message. Because there are times in my life, man, I've been so mad at God. Like, Lord, I, I'm doing all these things for you, and this is how you do. This is how you hurt me. And maybe you feel that way too. Like, I mean, you, you know, you, you, you feel like you're, you're following Christ, you're closer than ever. Man, then hardship after hardship, pain after pain comes your way. You're like, man, I, th I thought God was supposed to make my life better. But the truth is that suffering comes for all of us. That the Christian is not exempt from, from pain and trials and tribulations or whatever you want to call it. We're not exempt from that. But it is part of our life. It's part of the reality of living in a fallen universe that is cursed for rebelling against God. The difference is, is that our suffering and the hardship we go through has purpose now. Because we can tap into God and go, Lord, why? Why'd you let that happen? What, what purpose does it serve in my life? And God, in all your infinite wisdom and all your knowledge, as you see everything, and with all your power and your might, why did you let this happen to me? Why did you okay and approve the suffering that's going on in my life? Christians do suffer. Even uh, Paul and, and the Thessalonian Christians who were following God and being obedient and learning and serving him, even they went through trials and hardships. And we can ask God, man, why? Why am I going through that? You know, verses uh, like James 1, 2 through 4, talk about the purpose of suffering. Or verses like 1 Peter, verses chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. And the purpose of suffering to strengthen us, to test us, to prove that we are really Christ's, that we belong to Jesus, that nothing will take that away. To prove that we're the real deal. To test our faith. Suffering has purpose. And so for Christians, know that even, uh, you know, even the early followers of Christ suffered. They went through hardships. You know, Paul went into uh, 
Thessalonica and, 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 and developed his church. The Lord blessed his ministry. But over time, man, people drove Paul and his companions out. And the Thessalonian Christians were left there kind of alone. I mean, they, they had been taught and developed by Paul as long as they could. But I mean, eventually Paul and his team was forced out. And they were separated from their dear friends and their loved ones, the people that they cared for in Christ. And it hurt. And Paul longed to be with them. He wanted to see them as he was torn away from them, it says here in verse 17. He wanted to be with them. You know, they were torn. He recognized they were torn away in person, but not in heart. That through Christ they were still together. But how? How do you get through that kind of pain? You know, so so suffering is a reality of, of life, even for the Christian. God doesn't protect us from suffering and hardship, but He does give those things meaning and purpose in our life. So how do we get through the suffering? How do we get through the pain? Uh, when we're going through hard times. Well, that's how, how did Paul do it? And so we sent Timothy. Nope. Verse 17. But since we were torn apart from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, but not in heart, we eagered, we endeavored all the more eagerly to see you face to face with great desire we wanted to see you. Because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. How did Paul get through that tragedy? And he wanted to be around other Christians. He wanted to see his brothers and sisters in Christ. He didn't want to be alone anymore. And that's why church and, and the body of Christ is so important. Because this world will eat us alive. All the things that we go through, the the day-to-day, -day, the big events... And we need each other. What did Paul do when he was torn from his brothers and sisters in Christ? He wanted to be with them. He wanted to go see them. He wanted to spend time with them face to face again. He wanted that. He craved it. And so when we're suffering, we're going through hardship. And we need each other. We need to be there with one another. We give each other phone calls and spend time with each other when we can. That's why church is important, to give us a place to, to gather, to be there, and to lift one another up, to encourage one another, to give each other a shoulder to cry on. Because we're not called to be alone. The Bible tells us that Satan is a roaring lion looking for whoever he can devour. You know how a lion hunts? And they look for the one that's hidden away from the crowd. They, they see the herd, but they find that one that's a little bit too far off. They see that one that's not paying attention. They find that weak one, that slow one, that one that's alone. That's how they hunt. They don't go after the biggest, fastest antelope and, and catch them and tear them down. No. They go after the weakest, the loneliest, the most vulnerable. And Satan is like a lion, looking for who he can devour. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we cannot live a life alone. Now, people will say, man, I don't need church. I don't need the family of God. I just got my Bible and, and prayer, and, and I'm going to learn everything I can. I'm going to have that relationship with God. And it doesn't turn out real well. This world eats you alive. Life is tough. We need each other to learn from each other. We need each other so we can see how to, how to imitate. How do we balance one another? How do we serve alongside one another? We need each other. And we're going through hardship and suffering. Man, Paul recognized that. Even though he was torn away from the Thessalonian Christians, he was like, man, I want to be with you. I miss you guys. I don't want to do this alone. That's how Paul wanted to get through his suffering. You know, and he, he wrote him letters. He sent out uh, other companions to, to get news back and see how people were doing. Man, he wanted to be with people. And so the same for us. And we're going through hardship. we got to make sure that we are spending time with fellow Christians, that we're not alone in, 
in this life, that we're not suffering alone and hurting all by ourselves in the darkness, but we're sharing with one another and being lifted up and lifting up one another. Another purpose that suffering has is it makes us ask some very tough and very real questions. Listen to Paul as, as he is experiencing the suffering as he knows that he is being hindered by Satan himself uh, and uh, as he doesn't get to do what he wants to do. Paul asks some very important questions here in 19. For what is our hope, our joy, or our crown of boasting before the Lord at his coming? Suffering has a way of challenging us in our thoughts, in our process, and in our suffering, in our hardship, we see who we really are. You know, it, the pain causes us to go to what we really want, what we really desire. Suffering brings out those questions. What's our real hope? What is our real source of joy? What is it? You know, uh, for Paul, in this, in the, you know, he asked the question about his hope. What is our hope? What is our joy? And in this passage, he answers, what is his joy? But the hope for Paul, when you read out through all of his writings throughout the scriptures, Paul's hope is Jesus Christ. And, and when we're suffering... It makes us ask, man, what is, what is my hope? What, what gets us through the day? What gets us on to the next thing? Is it, are we like Paul? Is our hope Jesus Christ? Man, for, for Paul, Jesus was everything. You know, it, you know, Paul's hope wasn't built on his good deeds. It wasn't built on his discipleship. It wasn't built on his Bible memorization. It wasn't built on his attendance. Paul's hope wasn't built on his spiritual gifts and the miracles he did. Paul's hope alone was on Christ and the resurrection. Because if Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, everything that Jesus says is true. And it proves that he really is the Son of God. And that salvation really is through him. If Christ is raised from the dead, then when Jesus says, nobody comes to me, no one comes to the Father except through me, and that's real. You know, when Jesus says he lays down his life as a ransom for many, that, that's real. When Jesus says, I am the, uh, the way, the truth, and the life, or when he says, you know, like John 3, 16, right? You know, uh, no one shall perish, but everyone who believes in me will have eternal life. Man, that's real. That's true. If Christ is raised from the dead and, and, and Paul, his hope was built on Christ alone, not on his good deeds, not on his, his, uh, his actions or his prayer life or anything that Paul did, but Paul's hope in, for everything was on Christ and on the completed work of Jesus, the cross and the resurrection. That was Paul's hope. And so we, we go through hardship and pain. And we experience issues and setbacks. What is your hope? What is that source of energy that drives you on to the next day or gets you to the next goal? What keeps you going day after day? What is your hope in? Is it in governments? Is it in pieces of paper? Is it in constitutions? Is it in your abilities? Is it in swords or weapons or firearms? What is your hope? What do you rely on? Is, it, is your hope built on uh, civilization and people? Is it built on family? Is it 
built on friends. See, the thing is, all those things crumble. None of those things last forever. Only Christ. Only Christ lasts forever. When this world passes away, the Lord Jesus will be there. And his word will last forever. And the work that we did in ministry with him in, in expanding the kingdom and talking to people and, and making disciples and saving souls, that's what will last forever. The work of God, the church of God will last forever. And so when we go through hardship, we see who we really are. What do we rely on? What do we say the answer is to these things? Is it ourself or is it otherworldly things? Or will we rely on Christ? Paul here is to go on. He, he, he keeps asking, well, what's your joy for Paul? One of the sources of joy in his life was ministry. 19 again, for what is our hope and our joy and our crown of boasting before the Lord Jesus at his coming. When everything passes away and the Lord Jesus has come back and we are standing before him, what's, what's our hope in? What's our joy in? Paul says this, Is it not you? For you are our joy and our glory. The Thessalonian Christians doing ministry with them, raising up disciples and followers of God, people who are saved from wrath and brought to new life, resurrected in the hope and the gospel of Christ. That, that brings Paul joy. That's real joy, the kind of joy that lasts forever. Man, I, I've gotten happiness out of, and joy out of a lot of things. You know, from people to video games, uh, you know, man, fun events, new toys, hobbies. But all that stuff fades away. All that stuff doesn't last. But ministry does. Telling people about Christ, changing lives, giving people new hope, a second chance, forgiveness, all that found in Christ, ministry. Brothers and sisters, that lasts forever. And uh, and the timing that we would come upon this passage, you know, man, as, as the world goes through pain and hardship and sadness, what's our hope in? What do we really find joy in? That's one of the purposes of suffering and pain. I mean, suffering and pain is not you know, something new. But for Christians, we're not excluded from it. We are going to experience hardship just like these people did, just like the Thessalonian Christians did, just like the early church did, just like Paul did, just like Christ did. You know, pain is nothing new. Suffering is nothing new. But suffering for Christians does have a purpose. It's not just bum luck. It's not just random uh, issues. It's not just, you know, we drew the, the short stick in the genetic lottery. You know, no, suffering has a purpose. It, it causes us to be refined. It makes us think, man, what am I holding on to? What am I relying on? What is my source of hope and joy? Because that's, and that speaks about who we really are. And so because suffering causes us to look inward and to grasp for, for something, for anything to keep us going, it makes us ask those questions. And we get to see who we really are. When we're down and we're broken, what do we reach for to get us going, to keep us alive? What do we hope in? What's our source of joy? And Paul asks tough questions while he's hurting why he's alone, why he's longing to be with his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ as he's torn away from them, he says. And our suffering should do the same. Make us ask those questions. So for you today, uh, 
maybe write down in the comments, man, what are some things that you struggle with that, that hold on to your hope and your joy? You know, it, it should be Christ. And I, I know for me it should be too, man. And in and, and, and this hardship, man, even I've got to stop and go, man, what am I holding on to? What's my hope? And what's my joy? What do I find happiness and peace in? Because I'm fallen, I'm human, I'm just like everybody else. I'm not perfect. And I need to be refined, and I need work, and Jesus is working on me. Especially through this passage. And so I would encourage you, man, figure that out. Where's your hope and joy? Yes, suffering is a part of life. But for us, it serves a purpose. And we need to get through it together. That's one of the best ways that we're not alone. That we need each other. All right, let's close out in prayer, shall we? Father God, thank you so much for giving suffering and pain purpose in our life. Don't know that you ask the tough questions in scriptures so we can reflect upon ourselves that your spirit can guide us and convict us as you see fit. Lord, we need you. And so as we go through pain, may we be like your servant Paul and ask those tough questions. And may we grow through the hardship and become more like your son as we are refined. Father, I pray that you would help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, thank you all so much for tuning in to the Midweek Bible Study. God bless.